And welcome to a sleepy bedroom edition of Ben's Junk. Back in Colorado, I had everything in at least semi-regular use mashed into one room, that room where I used to do archive. And as I mentioned in the first episode I did here, the top goal with this new place was to be able to separate work and life as much as possible, uh, i.e. trying to have the bedroom be just that. And I half succeeded. But anyway, one unintended consequence of the new arrangement was that all my stereo equipment was now living in the room that I set up to audition, do transfers, do the legwork for Oddity Archive, and also just be a living room. But in other words, if I'm in the bedroom working on the computer and just wanted to casually throw in a CD, throw on an LP, listen to the radio, I'd have to pack everything up, including my desktop, and do it in that other room that I set up. So this meant having to create some sort of reduced stereo setup in the bedroom. And I do mean reduced. Uh, this room is at best three quarters the size of the already crammed old all-in-one Archive HQ. So I went online to see if they still made those little narrow bookshelf receivers that were kind of sort of a big deal back in the late 90s, early 2000s. And I wanted one of those, you know, nice narrow ones so I could stick it in my little bit of Ikea vinyl storage. Anyway, these receivers still exist, they're still made, but most of them are either off the charts expensive, or they're these ultra cheap, quick and dirty Chinese hunks of junk. And the precious few in between were really low on features, uh, like usually only one input and nothing else. So I started rooting around Fleabay for the, uh, I guess now vintage ones, and in terms of what was available at that moment, I only found a couple of models that I felt were suitable. Uh, the criteria being CD, AM, FM radio, and uh, of course you got to have the loop for AM, and at least two RCA phono inputs and one either digital coax or optical input. I failed on that front, but I'll expand on that later. Now, as for the old receivers I found on Fleabay, they were mostly in the $150 to $250 range, uh, which I thought was a little steep for fairly basic 15 to 20, and in some cases 20 plus year old gear. But I wound up going with a Fixer Upper Onkyo CR305TX from 2004, and I think it was $35 plus shipping, but it did not come with the radio antenna, antennae, uh, nor the remote, but I was able to cobble all that together separately, so whatever. But the whole thing was a gamble anyway, because I couldn't get a straight answer from the seller on whether or not the CD player worked. But I've encountered things like that before. I've encountered stuck laser lens tracks and ill-functioning disc trays before, and I've always been able to fix them. So I figured, well, if the CD player doesn't work right out of the gate, I should be able to fix it, barring the laser itself being dead. And so I got the receiver. Sure enough, the laser lens track was stuck. So I dismantled the receiver, took that whole part of it out, cleaned it, worked it by hand a little, put it back in, adjusted it, and I got everything working again, except the laser itself. And so the jerry-rigging begins. I'm sure I'll eventually wind up getting a different receiver, but here's what I've worked out, at least in the short term. 
Now, I failed big time on one of the specs of the receiver itself. Uh, when I saw this unit on Fleabay, I thought, oh, sweet, it's got an optical input. Now, bear in mind, at the time, I was just starting to try to make archive again and still trying to get settled in, trying to acquire the last of the furniture. And so I was working on this whole little bedroom stereo dilemma in stolen moments and just before going to bed at night. And needless to say, it did not have my full attention. But I figured, well, I've got a little Blu-ray player in here. I can just run the audio out of that to the receiver and I'll use that for a CD player. And better yet, I can run it to the optical jack and then I can keep the RCAs open for uh, you know, the turntable and I can also have a free auxiliary input for an iPod or cassette or mini disc Walkman or maybe a quick convenient means of testing something out. But uh, anyway, it was only after accidentally ordering a DA converter and then subsequently intentionally this time ordering a coax to optical adapter. Uh, it was only then that I realized I'd been barking up the wrong tree this whole time. So the text gets a bit obscured by the motor, motor housing and screws and stuff, but uh, you may have read it already. It's actually an optical output because I guess the intended use of this receiver was to make perfect duplicates of things. So I wound up using the otherwise unwanted DA converter. The initial plan was to replace my old speakers in the main stereo setup, uh, the surround setup, and just reuse the front left and right speakers in here. Well, one, I did a basic test and the sound was atrocious. And two, years ago, I totally shot myself in the foot. I messed with the speaker wire options on the back of those old speakers. And if you've watched Archive long enough, you've seen them, the gray Iowa speakers. Uh, but you had the option of using phono plugs or regular speaker wire, both of which were already in the factory hardwired to the speakers. So when I got my still in use Pioneer receiver way back in 2003, I trimmed down the regular speaker wire to only the then necessary length. And I just outright cut off the phono lines because they were getting in my way. But unfortunately, there wasn't enough length to reach the receiver in this room. Uh, it would take about 16 feet of wire per speaker to make it neat. So six feet down, about six feet across, a couple feet around a corner and a couple feet up. And yeah, trying to braid together speaker wire just wasn't going to happen. So back to the Internet, I went and I started digging around the reviews for best budget speakers, and I wound up going with this pair of Dayton Audio bookshelf speakers, uh, 35-ish dollars for the pair on Amazon. And I've got to say, I was mightily impressed. Now, the receiver has an input for a separate subwoofer, and... I was really worried that the sound on these new things was going to be pure mid-range tin. So I had my eye on a separate small narrow subwoofer that I could put on the floor between pieces of furniture and uh, also maybe like a small used graphic EQ if I needed it to hopefully balance things out. But these speakers have been great, uh, far better than I ever would have expected out of a pair of $35 bookshelf speakers. Uh, really nice frequency response, nice definition. It's handled everything I've thrown at it really well, and I can throw some pretty bad things at it. And as for the whole speaker wire dilemma, it's not hardwired. You have to cut and install all that stuff yourself. And that's exactly what I wanted. I actually wanted a little control this time. But anyway, I am going to break Ben's junk tradition today by not demoing anything this time out because it would be kind of pointless. I mean, uh, how are you going to gauge a pair of speakers by a recording of them on YouTube? 
And uh, as for the Onkyo, the only realistic, useful test I could do would be the radio, and that's kind of pointless, uh, especially when I'm using an aftermarket antenna. And uh, for what it's worth, the reception is thoroughly mediocre. But I will say, uh, non-functioning CD player notwithstanding, it is not the most user-friendly thing. Uh, the Onkyo is not intuitive at all. Uh, the remote has no logic to its layout. A uh, lot of up and down arrows, but they all seem to do different things and they're not labeled. And some functions seem to be missing. Like, I can't seem to dial in a specific radio station with that remote. If I can, I just haven't figured it out yet. But I guess where it does work, it does its job. But anyway, I guess that is truly it for today. I will talk to you again soon.